Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. Uh, my guest for this show is John, John Tregonis. He's the author of Crowdfunding for Filmmakers. We're going to talk about crowdfunding. He's a filmmaker. He's Indiegogo's head film campaign strategist, working behind the scenes on successful film, video, theater, comic book, and gaming campaigns. And he's used crowdfunding to fund his film. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. Thank to be here. It's a pleasure. So you've helped thousands of filmmakers worldwide create compelling crowdfunding campaigns that reach or exceed their goals. That's what they tell me. Uh, no, <laughs> no, yeah, I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of filmmakers. and uh, Thousands. That's incredible. Trying to make them successful. I, I was surprised to see that 70% of funding came from strangers. Um, in general, uh, specifically with my campaign, that's, that's kind of how I jumped into everything. Um, I, I was as shocked as anybody else because normally, I mean, you know, it's kind of the norm, I guess. It's, it's just, it depends on how well you do the crowdfunding. So 30% is always going to come from the people that we know. It's just, I try to disprove this every day. I can't. It's, if you don't get your family and friends and people that you know in on day one to three, who else is going to give money? Not random strangers. They want to make sure you're successful. So for me, that 70% coming from strangers was not necessarily strangers, but it, it, it was people that I met on Twitter that I didn't have any personal connections with outside of a few conversations about independent film. So they were the first people to jump on board. Again, we're talking, when I did that, it was 2010. So very different time for crowdfunding. Back then when you launched a campaign, that was a big deal. Now it's not a big deal. Now it's like, okay, well, what do you got? You know, kind of thing. So, but 70% still does come from the general public if you're doing the work right. But, but from what I, what I just heard you say was that you really need to get your family and close friends in right away to kind of prime the pump. Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. Because, uh, you know, again, the, the public, when we see it, we want to see that a campaign's successful. It's all psychology. We want to look at that green bar. It's actually called the green bar effect on, on an Indiegogo campaign. If it's like tiny, people are like, oh, it doesn't look like it's doing too well. But the more it stretches to the end goal, the more people get excited about contributing. We're not going to question where that beginning money comes from. We're going to assume that it's just, you guys are doing great. Most of us probably know that it's your friends and your family because that's the same thing that we would do if we were going to crowdfund because who else? The idea that we're going to have a great idea, no matter what it is, and we're going to put it up on a platform and then wait for random people to, to throw money at it. That's as, that's as uh, mythological as the money tree. Okay. So now you're, you work for Indiegogo. You, 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 you started a blog, you were successful with it, you were coaching a lot of people, and in, so Indiegogo invited you to go on the team to, to work with people bringing films. But, uh, and your book focuses not just on Indiegogo, though, uh, so talk a little bit about the options that are out there for crowdfunding. I mean, the options, you know, the, right now there's, there's probably the two big ones, Indiegogo and Kickstarter. I mean, those are the ones, those are the name brands. Um, there's other ones that are more, you know, there's one called Patreon. It's focused around subscription crowdfunding where you're not just making a one-time contribution, but you're actually subscribing and monthly contributions come out every month. Um, and then you have uh, other brands that focus on other aspects of crowdfunding, like personal cause fundraising and things like that. You caring is one of those, um, you know, for, for people who aren't necessarily trying to create a tech product or a film or a game, but they're trying to just raise money to, you know, get some cat surgery that it desperately needs. And the, the parents of the cat can't afford it. And it gets, uh, it, it can be on that level and then it can be more serious. And then you've got, you know, the political spectrum and all that stuff. So um, those are the options that are out there. 
What are the prime differences between Indiegogo and Kickstarter? Good question. Um, the, I mean, the, the main difference is that with Indiegogo, you get to keep the money that you raise. There's an option, we call it flexible fundraising, where if you don't hit your goal, you'll still keep whatever money you've raised because, you know, you earned it. You, you worked your ass off and you earned it. Um, the, with Kickstarter, they have only a fixed model, which is you got to hit your goal or, you know, you don't get anything. We have that model too, but we're definitely well known for having that option. And filmmakers and creators uh, definitely love that because, hey, look, you might want $5,000 to make a short film, but you only get $3,000. Well, you know what? You can still make a short film for $3,000 if you need to. So that's good to have that money instead of doing all that work. And then you don't hit that goal and you get zero. What are the numbers in terms of the percentages and charges for Kickstarter and for Indiegogo making it or not making it? It's all 5%. It's all 5% for, for all, all three, for Indiegogo either way? And for, for Indiegogo either way, we take 5% uh, and I believe it's the same with Kickstarter still. Okay. And there's credit card processing fees that go directly to the credit card. That's about 3%. Uh, roughly. So in any campaign, you're looking to lose about 8% just on the use of the platform and the payment processing. Okay, great. It's a good number to know before you jump in. So why would somebody use Kickstarter then? Um, that's a damn good question, actually. I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, no, the, you know, at the end of the day, crowdfunding platforms are there to serve a purpose, right? It's like to help people get the money that they need to make something real from nothing. The idea is you know with with let's say kickstarter right now they've kind of they've kind of built that name and they're sailing on it whereas indiegogo has been innovating on the on what you can do with the platform and then after your campaign is over so we have a lot more options in that sense the first thing i'll definitely mention is we have something called in demand which basically means if you've hit your goal on your campaign and the deadline hits the campaign doesn't close. The campaign stays open indefinitely or as long as you want it to be open. Whereas with Kickstarter and, and basically every other platform that's out there, once you hit your goal and the deadline hits, you're done. Campaign's closed and then basically they move you to do whatever else you got to do. If you got to contact people through email, you do it through email. With Indiegogo, we're trying to keep people on the site using the tools that we're providing long after the campaign itself is over, which is very forward thinking, um, you know, in, in that sense. That's just one of the, that's my favorite tool actually, because it's kind of nice to just leave the campaign open for three, four more months. And then all of a sudden you promote once a, once a week and then you're getting little bits of money coming in here and there without the rigorousness of a campaign for 30 days or 60 days where it's like nonstop. So what are your three biggest pieces of advice for someone creating a crowdfunding project? Oof, good. Um, my first, I think my first, there's no way for this. Um, the first thing I would say is you got to have some kind of, a, of an audience that's a little bit built in. What I mean by a little bit built in is you're not going at the campaign from scratch. If you have a product, you have to know that people want it. You have to be sharing on social media. You have to be going out to places and building up an email list and a social network that is engaged with you before you even think about raising even $10,000. Because the, more, the less people you have that know about you and your campaign before it launches, the less money you're going to raise. It's just as simple as that. That's part of the, the pre-launch crowdfunding work, if you will. You know, we have to be working every day to just say, hey, I have this great idea. What do you think? Oh, awesome. Sign up for my email list. We'll send you word when we're starting to put it together, when we're doing a campaign. That's the bit, one of the biggest things that people just, they don't take seriously enough. You know, especially, I would say, filmmakers and, and creatives, because they're, we're all so used to doing things on social media that we forget about little things like, man, got to have an email list because if Facebook dies tomorrow, they own all my people. I don't own a single one unless I own their email address.
Well, this gets back to having a platform, really, right? Yep. So yes. a, plat a platform usually involves having a website or a blog yep. and having a way for people to sign up and, and motivation for people to sign up. So how do you get people to give you your email, their emails so you can build that list? What do you do? I mean, the easiest thing, and, and this goes with anything, is you got to have content. It's all about content nowadays. You got to show people, not tell them, because everybody tells them, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Nobody cares. We got to show them stuff. So if you have a product, I want to see some blueprints. I want to see a video of you testing one of the earliest designs that you made in your basement. And get me excited about the possibilities. It's all about that kind of content, putting it out there and letting people see and give you feedback and wanting more. And this is even before your crowdfunding project goes live you're talking about. Absolutely. Long before. Uh, long before, I'd say at least, it depends on the project, but like two months is a good amount of time to start building. You can do that sounds like hardly anything for somebody who's really got some serious work to do there. Right. I mean, it could be. I'm, I'm, I'm basically thinking like this is the person who's, I mean, most, let's say most like, um, tech campaigns, like they're making this their full-time job, right? They have a product they think is going to change the world. They quit their job. They make it their, their day job and they're focusing. So two months for them is totally fine to build up an email address, to, to, to do that, that legwork. For a creator, not so much. We don't typically have enough guts to, to jump and be like, I have a great idea for a film. I'm quitting my job and I'm going to focus. Absolutely not. They might need six months. They don't have the, the back savings to do it either, probably. <laughs> and it, that, I, I, I'm there. Not with artists. <laughs> that's it. Uh, that's <laughs> it. Although I what they do, but they're not getting rich from it. So, yeah. okay. So you, you just said something that you mentioned in the book. By the way, the book is Crowdfunding for, for Filmmakers. Uh, you, you, you say that this is a full-time gig. It, it is. Yeah. Crowdfunding is a full-time job. I think I say it in the book about five times just to remind people. At least. Yeah. Because, uh, and, and I, I'm not even necessarily, when I say that, I'm not talking the pre-launch work. I'm talking running the campaign. Once you launch it, starts the full-time job, whether you have a full-time job already or not. The pre-launch stuff can be done at your own pace. You know, if you have a full-time job, you got to feed the kids. I, we get all that in between the side hustle, right? That, that's what the pre-launch is. But once that campaign goes live, that is an everyday promotion and marketing blitz that you are doing to get people actively contributing. Because talking about the film or the product early on, that's easy. Getting an email list by putting out content, that's easy compared to getting them to actually say, you know what? I'm buying in to this thing that I'm probably not going to see for six months to a year from now, but I like it so much I'm buying in. There's a difficulty level in that. And it takes not only just promoting and promoting and promoting, it takes ingenuity to figure out ways to psychologically get people to want to see more of what you're doing so badly that they will plop down $25 or $500 to, to be, to, to have this product or see this film before anybody else. Okay. So you I asked you for three uh, biggest pieces yeah. of advice and you said the first one, have a built-in audience and yeah. have a mailing list that you've put together. What are two others? So the, another one I would say is set the right goal. Uh, this is, this is a big one. Um, I actually wrote, I did a, a, a video, um, about six big mistakes. Um, it was the first time I ever talked about mistakes because I kept on seeing that there'd be a lot of great campaigns, but their goals would be ridiculously high for filmmakers in particular, just to use an example, the number that I see it's way too often set as a goal amount is $200,000. Now to make a film, that's not a lot of money, but for an independent filmmaker, that's a ton of money. If you know how to, how to finagle a dollar and, and really stretch what it's worth. Um, you give me $200,000, I'll make a kick-ass film. Like, let me just put it that way. Um, because I know where to kind of, allocate stuff. Some people don't. They're like, oh, this movie's going to cost 15 million. Well, you're not going to raise necessarily 15 million if you have 50 Twitter followers. 
you know? So the idea is looking at not your budget for whatever you're trying to do, but what you think you are worth socially and through your email list, looking at that work that you've done and being a hundred percent honest with yourself and say, I can get $5,000 from my family. So I should probably set a goal of no more than 15,000. You may need 50,000, but if you set 50,000, 30% of that is not $5,000. And if you don't have that first third from friends, family, and diehard supporters in the first week, you're not going to be able to build up that momentum to hit $50,000. And I talk a lot about that because, like I said before, Indiegogo's got the idea where you get to keep the money even if you don't hit your goal. But we still have to cater to people out there, the general public, who look at a campaign that has not hit its goal and say that it's a failure. Because in reality, it's not a failure. If you look at it, did you get some money to move that project forward? If the answer is yes, then you know what? That's as successful as anything else, but not to the Neanderthal minds who think that success means hitting the goal or nothing. So it's essential to get family and close friends to support. How do you do that? Pick up the phone. <laughs> um, that's what, literally what I tell people. I say, look, you got to hit up your family. We do something called a soft launch. The soft launch is, let's say you're going to launch on February 5th. Well, you should technically be launched already and reaching only out to your friends and your family. Everybody who you talk to on a regular basis. Now, regular basis isn't as much as it used to be nowadays. Um, but whoever you talk to, you go see your mom once a week, she's on that list. You talk to your best friend once a month, he's on that list. Get those people involved first. So you basically launch the campaign, you reach out only to them. You don't put it on social media, you don't put it on your mass email list, just to that special group of core contributors. And you say, hey, I want you guys to be a part of this, number one. First and foremost, I want you guys to be on board. Please give whatever you can. Some people will contribute, some won't. By the second day, you reach out again with the follow-up email. Hey, just want to make sure you got my email. Definitely want your support on this. You're, you know, you've, you've fed me for the last 23 years, I, I, but I could use a, a couple of bucks thrown this way. If they don't donate or contribute by that second day, that's when you pick up the phone, and you make the phone call. You send a text message. You say, listen, serious about this. This is, this is something that's passionate to me. I need the help. And we want to build up the right momentum so that I can attract other people. It's no different than trying to attract legitimate investors, right? They're not going to come to you if you don't have a couple of bucks already in and some people lined up who have already put in to help you get to where you are. It's the same thing. The only difference is slightly harder because you're not offering any kind of equity. You're offering a perk or you're offering a t-shirt or something like that. So that's the challenge. That is the soft launch takes about three, sometimes five days. But once in theory, you hit that 30%, that's when I tell people it's time for the official launch. And that's when you blast it out on your social networks and you blast it out on the widest email list possible. So let's say you're shooting for $10,000. You want your friends and family to come up with 3000. Absolutely. And if you don't do that, you're in trouble. Not necessarily trouble. It's just going to be a harder climb to hit the goal that you've set for yourself. And the reason it's going to be a harder climb is because it's going to take longer for you to get to that first third. And we've done so much research to find that that 30% mark is the moment where somebody like me looking at a campaign for the first time, I don't know who the person is, that's when I'm going to take it serious. When there's a good chunk of funding in that bar so that I can say, I think this is worth my five or $25. Now, I, I mean, I got to say that knowing that, I mean, it, it's almost worth calling up some people and say, hey, you put up the credit card, I'll refund it just so you guarantee that you have that. And then you put a goal that exceeds what you put out. I mean, you could, uh, the, you know, uh, that's sort of depending on, on how, how it is. Uh, it could be self-funding because um, we've seen a lot. I've seen cases like this and, and 
the uh, the trust and safety teams uh, typically crack down on those things pretty pretty hardcore um, because you don't want to self fund. It's not you know, and they can track that stuff. But you definitely you know, like again, that somebody puts in fifty bucks and then they put in the same person puts in another two hundred dollars in the same three days. It's like it looks a little bit suspicious. So you got to be careful with kind of stuff like that. I don't condone it in any way. I say just get your family to contribute. Just tell them not, you know, I mean, if, you know, not reimbursing, it's five bucks, it's 10 bucks, it's 25 bucks. We're not asking for major money. And anybody crowdfunding probably knows someone who can afford a latte once a day, which means they can afford $25 in five days, no lattes. So what is the average amount that people shoot for, for crowdfunding for a movie or a book or for whatever? It, it really, it, it depends on the project for, for, again, for tech products and things like that. I mean, some, depending on what the product is, sometimes they're, they're quite extravagant uh, amounts. They're $500,000 and up and they'll hit because they're doing all that pre-launch work and they're doing it properly. And they're going to get 30% of that from friends and family, $150,000 in, 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 that they're, gonna, they're going to get it from, so when you're doing the work, right? The you've got friends and family, but you've also got anybody who is die hard about your product or your film. Those people also can count uh, as day one core contributors if they're talking with you every time you post something, if they're responding to your emails, if they're clicking through. These are people you can rely on to also help with that. So, yes, some of those bigger amounts. It's not just friends and family, most likely. There's some also diehard fans, as I call them, in there. And they're in the soft launch? To get them. They're in the soft launch? Or, they, could, they can be uh, put into the soft launch category, for sure. Okay. But um, do you have, there's no ballpark average that, that people go for? I, I know it's all over the place. I mean, it's, it's all over the place only because there's so many categories. It's so like the one... Like, again, I, I know from working with, with films, I mean, the, the number, the ridiculous number is 200,000. Everybody thinks that they can raise that, and then they're severely shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, the amount that most people can raise with little to no effort is between fifteen and $50,000. Really? Yes. So, again, it's 15 is, is, is a little bit closer to what can get funded fairly rapidly and quickly and go above that goal. Because just because you hit fifteen thousand doesn't mean you're going to stop. If you hit your fifteen thousand dollar goal, you get thirty percent in two days, let's say, and then by the week and a half mark, you've hit your goal. You st you set stretch goals, and then by the end of thirty days, you could possibly double that amount. So when do you get the money? More. When do you get the money? If whatever you've raised, when do you get it? Uh, usually about fifteen, seven to fifteen days after the campaign closes. So you want to keep it open and afterwards, but you don't get it until you close it. Exactly. And, and whatever date you set, it, that's the date. So again, I, I had a campaign launch uh, yesterday. It's for a, uh, it's, for a it's, uh, it's called All for Cure. It's a cancer, um, it's like a, a, new a, a new cancer solving app type thing. Um, and basically they launched on day one, they had commitments for some decent sized funding and they had a, a pretty big friends and family network. Day one, they basically surpassed their goal. I think the goal was I'm not hundred percent sure what it was. It was, uh, I want to say 20,000. Wow. Like, first okay, day. Yeah. That's incredible. First day over it. So again, they have a whole month ahead of them. They can't move the date up and can't and close the campaign. You've got, you set 30 days, you're good for 30 days, but now they've got to stretch and come up with new ways to get more people incentivized to contribute. These guys can ultimately raise a couple of hundred thousand dollars or more. That's incredible. Doing things. All right, so we're going to go to the third item on the list in a moment, but a little yep. an ID here. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com on iTunes, on SoundCloud on Pacifica Radio, on Progressive Radio Network, on Google Podcasts. My guest for this show is John Tregonis. He's the author of Crowdfunding for Filmmakers, and we're talking about how to do crowdfunding. John is the 
head film campaign strategist for Indiegogo. And he's actually worked with thousands of people. So you, you, you gave us have a, have a built-in audience, set the right goal. What would you say is a third uh, essential uh, part of putting one of these together? Third part is, I would say, strategizing the campaign. Um, again, the, uh, it, it's not just a, a quick launch. It's the pre-launch work is important, very important. The uh, post-campaign work of fulfilling perks and actually you know, getting whatever you made and whatever you crowdfunded made and delivered is all part of it. But through the campaign, you're only as successful as how, how much you've strategized that campaign. And that basically means, well, I'll give you the, I'll give you the, the standard uh, back-end stuff. On, when you look at a campaign's timeline from day one to day 30, day one and two are going to be the biggest days that you have because you're going to soft launch and you're going to get everybody that you know in and there's going to be a huge spike. And then after day three, four, and five, it's going to go down substantially each time. And then there's going to be a moment about a week and a half in, and it's going to last quite a while sometimes. It's called the, uh, the lull, or some people call it the trough of despair. The trough of despair. <laughs> they just never get out of it, and they're like, they start crying. I was there too when I did it. I was like, why is nobody? I made zero dollars today. I almost wanted to throw in the towel, you know, but I made like $2,000 already, and it wasn't wasn't a big deal, you know, but there's that trough. And then at the end, when it's coming close to the finish, you're going to see a big spike, all the slackers, you know, and I, and I, and I use that term very, you know, like, like back to the future, very, very uh, cordially, you know, the people that are like, oh, shoot, I forgot to do it. Oh, it's still open. Good. You're going to get a lot of those people coming in. Some of them are going to be the friends and family that should have contributed earlier, but didn't. They waited. That's also a hard thing is to get them not to wait. Um, so this middle ground doesn't ever have to be a lull or a trough of despair. It depends on if you strategize it. And what that means is you know that a week in, you probably should update your campaign, your backers, uh, which basically means send a quick update on Indiegogo and just say thank you. If you can make a video, make a video of you saying thank you to them. Show the appreciation. All of a sudden, you're going to have a spike in funds raised because you're getting back in their periphery from a week ago when you launched. So you're back. Maybe a couple of days later, you do another update and you launch a brand new perk to get people who might not have backed but are following the campaign. They are going to get an alert to say, oh, they just launched a new perk. I haven't backed yet because I didn't like any of those perks. Let me see what they've got now. And you have another chance to get more people involved. Maybe you do a live stream event and you promote it. It's another spike. And you do a live stream on Twitter for like an hour. And you tell people about the movie or about the product and you get them more excited. And you'll start seeing little spikes. So then all of a sudden, this lull time becomes very filled with all these spikes going up of $200 raised here, $2,000 raised there. And you never know who's watching during that time. But that's the strategy is coming up with when you're going to launch new perks, when you're going to do a contest for referring people, because that's, that's another cool thing that Indiegogo does specifically is uh, you can do a referral contest. So somebody backs your campaign, you create a perk that you will give to the person who refers the most money to your campaign simply by promoting your campaign on their networks. So then you're building out a wider audience and you don't have to do the work. You're letting someone else do the work and whoever raises the most money for you will get a really awesome experience. Uh, my impression is that that referral part of it is really important. So many people don't do it as well as they should, but it can be such a powerful tool. And the reason they don't do it as well is because sometimes they just have a crappy perk. You like, they're like, oh, I'll give you another t-shirt a new design. That's boring. Like nobody wants that. Give us something exciting. Like what? If you're asking us to do work for you. Like if you have a celebrity in your movie, not an A-lister or a B-lister, but a celebrity, a C-lister, let's get a dinner with that person. You know? And if I help you raise, whether it's $500 or $5,000, if I help you raise the most out of all the other people who want dinner with that celebrity, I get to go to dinner. That's enticement. That's getting people excited about contributing. 
Now that's a that's a contest, but do, aren't there tools designed with with uh, Kickstarter or Indiegogo that automatically encourage sharing if somebody donates? Oh, absolutely, they all do. Where like once you make a contribution, it pops up, "Hey, share this campaign. You 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 backed it. You might as well share it." And that's great, but there's no incentive to. It's just like you're out of the goodness of your heart. So sometimes, I mean, I only, I back a lot of campaigns. I back like about 75 or something, but I don't share all of them because sometimes I back just because they're a friend of mine, but I really don't care too much about their, their project, but I backed it anyway. And I'm not going to like be like, oh, support this great campaign if I don't think it's great. You know, so the idea is you want to further incentivize people to do it because we don't want to rely on just the fact that they're helping you because you're a starving artist or you're, you're a startup that's just trying to get a leg in and get this product made. No, that, that was, that was five years ago. We did that. Now it's like, no, no, what do we get? The backers in crowdfunding in 2018 are savvier than they were in 2010. So now they can actually make decisions to say, I'm going to back this over my friend's campaign because I actually think this is a cool product. And they're going to get something. And they're going to get something, absolutely. Something now and then the product later. Okay. So uh, you, you, let's get to the basics. What does somebody need to put into a crowdfunding project? I, I understand a video is just about essential. What yeah. else? What are the key elements in putting together the different pieces before you go live? Great question. Um, yeah, the videos, I'm not even going to talk about that because nowadays everything's video. So, and it's the quickest way. It's the quickest way to get my idea and my passion, more importantly, to you than in any other format. Yeah, you could write down a bunch of words on the page. That should be extra information. But what we're doing is the first thing we're going to see is that, that video. We're going to click it. We want to see your face. Tell us and show us how much passion you've got. Passion is still, in 2018, it's still addictive. It still gets people to say, you know what? I'm in for 50 bucks. You know, even if the idea is mediocre, the passion will get that money in. Well, well, please do talk a little bit about the video. How long should a video be and what should be in it? Perfect. It changes a little bit with different categories. I'll, I'll go into a little tiny bit of that. But the bottom line is you have to be in it, the person. Not looking off to the side as if you're being interviewed by a, a documentary filmmaker and you're talking about your product to somebody over here, we're over here. My eyes are here as a backer. Talk to me because I'm the person that's going to give you money. So talk directly to the camera. If you have a product, show us the prototype. If you have storyboards for a film, show us what you've got. Cut into it. If you have, let's say you're, you're doing a, a film's post-production, we got to get the sound right. We got to make the picture look better. Well, that means you shot the movie already. Show us a couple of snippets of the movie while you're talking over it so that we can actually see that you're a filmmaker who if we give 50 bucks to, you'll know how to use it. Because nowadays you pick up your iPhone, you're a filmmaker. Doesn't make you a filmmaker. Um, so we have to prove those things. We gotta be credible. So those are definitely things that we should do in any video. If you're making a video game, Maybe you don't have to necessarily be in there for too long because it's not about you. It's about the video game, but we definitely need to see some footage of whatever the video game is. Well, you say in your book that you need two stories. There's the project and the creator. Absolutely. So you've got to tell a story about yourself too? To an extent. If you, if you have a good story, some people don't have good stories, um, you know, and, and you can only tell the, the oh, I've been, I've been in my basement building this thing for like six years. You can only, that story is already getting pretty much uh, archetypal. Uh, so let's get rid of that story. Tell us a little bit about you. I'll give you the example of my, my video, which I made, and I didn't know anything about making these videos. I just kind of came up with this. But I was like, here's my idea for the film, but who am I? I'm a prof Back then I was a professor and I was teaching the youth of America. That's what got people in. Because they were like, oh, man, this guy's in the nitty gritty. He's helping the world. He's like, this is the, the assumptions they made just by me saying, I teach the youth of America. Because I'm a teacher and everybody wants to support a teacher. So I was like, oh, cool. And that's also why a lot of that money that I got came in from people that knew me vaguely rather than personally. 
because they were already attached to my story as a professor. So you might not have that story, but if you do, tell us a little bit about why you're making this. And that's your story, the why. Um, and then tell us the story of the product and how it's gonna change the world, the film and what it's about, the game and how it plays. Um, that's the two stories that you definitely need to, uh, you need to get across. And, a, and about how long should the video be? Yep. I was just gonna say that. Um, it used to be three minutes. It's dwindling down. Now it's about two minutes, 20 seconds. I would say your best bet, unless you have really cool video images that you're gonna overlay while you're speaking, this thing needs to be about two minutes long tops. Two minutes, okay. And just one video or maybe have a short one and a long one or? Could, yeah, that's actually, I've seen that and it's a good trend. I, I do like it because if you have leisure as a backer to look at a five minute long video that delves deeper, your prerogative, do it. But we gotta get people who have the tension span of a gnat in there because they might have that attention span of a gnat, but they might have the dollars of a, of a bumblebee. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, let's, let's get those people in, in two minutes. And then, we, especially with Indiegogo, like there's a gallery underneath the main video with, you can put photographs there and you can put additional videos. And I've definitely seen like, sometimes there's like five videos behind the scenes, you know, a little bit more about the product, how to actually contribute. You know, people get, fun and, and creative and they're all different lengths um and especially like for movies a trailer the trailer is not gonna make me put my money in to to help you make the film or finish the film it's gonna make me want to see it but i'll wait till it comes out on dvd or or on, on streaming i don't have to help you now so that's why the trailer it's good to have it if you've got one but we still need a shorter video that is going to tell us that, that you're going to be in telling us why we should actually help you finish this film or finish this game. So that's the video in general, really just keeping it concise is the, is the key thing. Aside from the video. What, one thing, what yeah, are, how, any tips on how to make the video? Is this something they should do on their notebook computer, just sitting in front of it like you and I are now, or any other tips on the actual process you're, I mean, you're a filmmaker. Did you, yeah. how did you do I, yours? I mean, I, I, I made my video, uh, got my buddy who's, who shot all my films to, to come to Jersey and, and shoot it. So it looked nice. Um, we shot little snippets to kind of visually illustrate what I was going to be saying on the camera. That's just, I went above and beyond. It was a whole day of shooting. You don't need to do that. But, I mean, you could do it like just like this, as long as the lighting is good, and as long as you can, you can be heard clearly, that's usually good. Now, I say usually, because if you are a filmmaker, and you're trying to make a $50,000 film, that campaign video better showcase the fact that you know how to make a $50,000 film. So you're not gonna shoot it on your iPhone, unless you have a good lens on your iPhone, that is going to be able to capture an image that's a little bit better quality and makes it seem with lighting and with audio that this is a professional. Are there, well, I would imagine if, if let's say you're trying to raise money for that friend's cat surgery, yep. an iPhone would probably be fine. Totally fine. Cause it's not about the quality. It's not about any of that. It's about saving a cat's life or saving somebody's life. You know what I mean? So at that point, and you're probably on a time crunch at that point. It's like, oh, we need this money because the cat only has six days to live. I don't know why I'm talking about the cat so much. Well, um, I brought it up, but, but what else? What else? Besides the video, what yeah. are the essential ingredients for putting together the, the crowdfunding page, basically? Yeah, so you also need the story section, which is where you're going to put all the additional information. Some of it's going to overlap with what's said in the video, but most of it is going to be additional information like, what the money is gonna be used for. We need to know where our money is gonna be spent. So there should be a pie chart of some sort, um, or at least bullet points, if you're not very uh, visually savvy and you don't know how to use Photoshop, um, you, know, you wanna tell us where this money is gonna go. You wanna tell us what some of the risks are. You know, what if you don't hit your goal? You're running a flexible campaign, which means you're gonna get the money. But what if you don't hit that goal? Will you still be able to do something? That's a question that a lot of savvy backers ask. 
because they know how this thing works now. Um, they want to make sure if they're putting in bigger amounts, like 50 and 100 bucks or more, that you are going to be able to do something whether or not you hit that goal. Um, definitely want to, if, if you're, you know, again, if you're, if, you, if you're making a product, we want to see the team. You want to have pictures of the team because it builds more credibility into the fact that this is a legit project and, you know, it's going to be made. Here's a team of people. Here's their Twitter accounts and their Facebook pages. You know, the more info you can give us, the more trust you build in us to be able to give you our money, which is one of our most trusted possessions, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I, I, I call this the bottom up show. Mm -hmm. are, are there particularly bottom up us? I mean, crowdfunding is one of the most bottom up things I can think of really. But are, are there, are there any particular aspects of crowdfunding that are bottom up that you can think of uh, in particular? Bottom up meaning just to clarify, make sure I, I got, I got exactly what that means. Bottom up is, is grassroots. It means yeah. cooperation. It means getting people at the, at the, at the base level helping mm -hmm. uh, rather than getting just one or two rich people handing you money. Well, that's the thing is if, if, if you're lucky enough to know one or two rich people, you don't need crowdfunding, go get them. The thing that crowdfunding does is builds your audience. That is the reason I tell people they should be crowdfunding. If they say that they want the money, I say, you know what? You can find an investor. They're out there. They're looking for stuff to throw money at. Go find them straight up because you will not have to work halfway as hard as you will crowdfunding by just going out and making a couple of phone calls, getting a few rejections and finally getting somebody to give you a million dollars. Easy. Crowdfunding is hard. What that person giving you a million dollars cannot get you as an audience. So they could invest a million dollars, take a cut of that, and then you don't have an audience to pitch it to because they didn't get that for you. So now they're out of money and you're, you look terrible. Crowdfunding is 110% all about the grassroots aspect of fundraising. It is, yes, you're going to get your hands dirty as a campaign owner. You are going to be talking directly to your customers, directly to your fans. If you don't like your fans, you're in the wrong business. Don't be crowdfunding and then get out of whatever business you're trying to be. Because without the audience, you got nothing in 2018 and beyond. And so it's, you write in the book about audience. You really think about that a lot. So I do. talk about how people should think about their audience. They should think about their audiences as partners. Partners in something that's bigger than all of us combined. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of tree hugger, kind of, oh, life is so great, I'm gonna give this big tree a hug, but it's absolutely true. And, I, and I'm saying it's true because I discovered it firsthand. I crowdfunded because I wanted to get some money. I crowdfunded because I didn't think it was gonna work. When I said, I saw crowdfunding for the first time, I said, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Nobody is going to give me money for my film. Nobody knows me. Well, I said, you know what? Let me put my money where my mouth is. Let me do it. I did it. People gave me money. Random people that I've been talking to for nine months on Twitter gave me money. And halfway into the second day, I had to take the I had to take the rest of the day off and really think about what crowdfunding was. And it was an aha moment. It was a Bruce Lee moment like no other, where I was like, this is not about the money. This is about the fact that I have been a genuine person for nine months. And I've been talking to people and I've been taking an interest in what they do. They take an interest in what I do. And all of a sudden I was rewarded, but I wasn't rewarded. I earned it. I earned every dollar. And I didn't even realize I was earning it when I was talking to those folks. So that changed me completely to the fact that I'm saying the audience is everything. I'm a poet. I'm a writer. I'm a filmmaker. I'm an artist. I got things to say. But if I got no one to say them to and no one who gives a damn to hear it, I got nothing. That's why I believe that the audience is everything. How do people understand who their audience is? Market research. <laughs> no, that's fair. Yeah. No, part of it. Um, I mean, I think, I think when you're looking at like technology companies that are trying out a new product, let's say, I mean, you, ha you have to know who your customers are. You have to know that there's a need. 
So with them, it's kind of easy, right? It's, well, not easy, but it sort of is. Like where you look at a problem, you know, oh man, I don't have time to do laundry. And then you say, I'm going to create an app where people can just plug in their info and then I'll go pick up their stuff and do their laundry for them and bring it over there. Solution, problem, solution. And if you find 50 or 100 people that actually would early adopt something like that, you know you've got something and then you go off and you crowdfund the app to make it even better and more robust and boom, you've got a business. So that's on that side. Filmmakers, unfortunately, don't think like that. Most creators don't. They just think, I want to get my movie out. I want to get my CD out. I want to get this done. They have to be with, they have to really work themselves within the communities that they are ultimately trying to impress with their own music, but they have to do it genuinely. They can't okay. do it about them. They got to make it about other people. So they, those other people will make it about them. Do it genuinely. Yep. Make it about other people. I like that. That's it. That's so the next thing I want to talk about is incentives, but I need to do another station ID. So this is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by OpEdNews.com, available on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. And I'm talking with John Tregonis. He's the author of Crown Funding for Filmmakers, and he's the head of Indiegogo's film campaign as a strategist. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yep. yeah and he's worked with thousands of filmmakers. So the, another key ingredient of, of doing crowdfunding is coming up with incentives. Yeah. So talk, what are the basics of incentives? What do you think about in terms of what you offer as incentives? Not just for movies, but also for, what are some of the, what are, what are some of the other most common uses of crowdfunding? A lot of the common use, like I'd say, um, especially with Indiegogo, like technology and products um, are, you know, like innovative products are like number one, you know, right now, like we, we you know, the, the coolest new gadgets get funded on Indiegogo before they get to the Apple store, like, or, or Brookstone. And that, that's just, that's, that's what crowdfunding has, has kind of become in a lot of ways. And, and the same can be said for obviously filmmakers too. They're creating new and innovative stories um, but yeah, tech, uh, films, gaming uh, is, is definitely up there. And then we're, I'm seeing a lot more writing and publishing type projects. You mean books or what oh, else? Yep. Books. Books and, and, and comic book graphic novels as well. So like all, all three encompassed. Um, so I would say in terms of incentives, obviously the one bottom line of all those is whatever you're funding, we need to get. And we need to get it early before everybody else does. So whether you're making a tech product, uh, you, know, that, you know, before it gets to Brookstone, I need to get it first because I'm buying in probably six months to a year early than anybody else. And I'm helping you make it. So I need to get it before, it, before my friends can go to Brookstone and buy it for retail price. And I need to get it at a discount. So let's talk about books, okay? Yeah. So how would it work with a book? With a book, you can, I've seen a few different things. Sometimes if, if, it's, a, if it's a straight up book, people will, will try to crowdfund for research money to fly them to certain locations so that they can do their research and, or fly them to a hotel to lock themselves up for you know, two months and write a book. Um, you know, I've seen all those kinds of use cases and I've also seen uh, the self-publishing route of, hey, I'm going to I'm going to, you know, make my book. I have the book here. The manuscript's done. I need to print it and publish it. So they'll do that and they'll get the ISBN and they, they basically get the audience that wants to read the book to pay for all that. Well, so, but those are the things they're going to spend the money on. But what are the incentives? Well, the incentive number one is the book, right? The other things that you can offer for any of these campaigns, I mean, there's merchandise, right? You, gotta, you probably want to do a mug, because mugs do really well on Indiegogo, and I'm not certain why. Um, yeah, I don't know why. I, I think people just like mugs. Um, so again, you price them appropriately, you'll sell a lot of mugs. Uh, What's appropriate pricing for a mug? Uh, just think about what you'd pay at a, at, a, at a shop. You know, if I went to London and bought a, you know, bought a mug over there, I'd probably pay about, you know, 35 pounds. So you're looking at 25, you know, maybe 20, uh, 45 bucks tops plus a little social media shout out, you know, and a couple of little digital goodies that make, you know, 
that make the, the, the $45 a little more worth it um, for the mug. And that's something that you have to ship. Um, so you have the audience pay for shipping as well. So ultimately it becomes a, a $40 or $45 or $50 perk. Um, but mugs do well. Uh, lapel pins are something that's a very popular trend right now. And if you have something that could be nicely illustrated in a pin, you should probably have that. And you could sell that for about 15, 20 bucks. Wow. Um, this is merchandise. I'm not a big fan of merchandise, uh, but for tech products, it's about merchandising and it's about the tech product for films. And, and as I wrote in my book, it, it's not, it's half the time. It's not about the perks. It's about, or it's not about the merchandise perks. It's about the other types of perks that I mentioned in my book, which are experiential and uh, personalized. Like what? So, so basically the example of an experience perk is going on the set of a movie, let's say, and being able to clap the clapper and call action. People love that stuff because it makes them feel like they're part of the production. Remember what I said before, with creatives, it's about making us part of the community and bringing us into our world. Nothing brings it in like getting one of these people to go down to our set and do this. That's a higher end perk. Probably won't be paying to fly them in. They'll have to take care of that. But if they pay us 600, 600 bucks, a thousand bucks, they'll get a bunch of other things, but they'll also get to snap that clapper and call action a few times on the set and we'll give them lunch. You know, that's something to get some of those deeper pocket backers in who love films and want to maybe be a producer. Producer credits, another big one, you know, executive and associate producer credits for movies are huge. You can get about $5,000 to sometimes $10,000 depending on what else you include. Those are experiences. Once the campaign's done, you can't get that anymore. It's done, you know? Um, well, wait, uh, just so yeah. for, for, a, for a producer credit, basically in exchange for doing the donation, they're listed as a producer on the movie? Yep. So they'll get on IMDb with that? Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's there, there are a, uh, and, and again, there, there was, for a while, there was a little debate on whether it was ethical, right? To, to be like, oh, I'm, I, I, you know, and I have campaigners sometimes coming to me and be like, I'm not selling producer credits. And I'm like, good, don't sell a producer credit because a producer actually does real work. Sell an executive producer credit because yeah. that's the money guy sell an associate producer credit all you got to do is make one phone call whether it's a yes or a no you're you get an exec an associate producer credit these are these are bs titles you know that you know what if you can make a thousand bucks off of an associate producer credit make a thousand bucks off it get them on imdb you're building up their resume as a producer win-win part of the community is there a, anything comparable for uh, somebody doing a book project um so a book, so it's interesting i mean the special thanks is a big deal, but even something like that, you might want to limit, you know, how many you offer or have it at a higher price. But definitely like a special thanks or an extra special thanks. There's not really a, an associate or executive producer. There's nothing saying that we couldn't make it up. You know, like I'd have no problem putting that title somewhere in my book, you know, my next book. I have no, no problem about that at all if somebody paid for it. So it really depends on how creative they want to get you know and there's fun ways that they can work it in um so yeah those are some experiential perks personalized are a little bit harder like what um, well i'll give my example um you know of my campaign i did poetry because i'm a poet i wrote poems for every backer at ten dollars and those poems were in the form of their name because my movie was about words i'm a poet I write words and I also needed to figure out how am I going to make my audience members care? Oh, I'll use the most important word as the background for the poem, which is their name. So sometimes I'd have to write a haiku for Jim. Sometimes I'd have to write a much longer poem for Samantha, but I wrote over 110 of those and wow. they were going, they were going. And because I'm a nutcase still am back then I was even worse. I made sure that the minute you contributed, I wrote that poem very quickly. My fiance would format it in Photoshop, because I can't use Photoshop to save my life, made it look really pretty, 
and we posted it within three days on your Facebook wall. Oh, what wow. happened is, and I didn't know this at the time, I was just trying to do something fun and good for my community. But what would happen is they were so impressed, they made it their profile picture, and then people, their friends would ask, where'd you get that amazing poem that's so awesome? And the next thing I know, I've got 10 new contributions and 10 new poems to write. So I was marketing because I was hustling harder than I probably should have been by writing these poems, getting them out because I wanted to deliver them and not have to do it after the campaign ended. But I was rewarded sort of by having to write over 110 of these things. But the $10 poem was where it started. If you gave me $500, you still got a poem. So that was the entry level perk. That was the most personalized. People loved it, but most of the people were given $25 and $50. And, and generally, the way perks work is you, you have a least expensive one, and then another level, and, and, and they're all added together generally, right? So you get, if you, if you give $100, you're going to get the $10, the $25, the $50 ones, and then the extra that comes in. At the yeah, you, that's changing slightly. I'm not a fan of the changing. Um, a lot of people are trying to, they're, they're thinking, in my opinion, they're thinking too much about the, the costs. So they're like, oh, I don't want to, we're not doing cumulative. But what happens is they're, they, their perks suffer because now they're trying to get a t-shirt for $75, but that's all we get. A t-shirt in this world will never be worth $75 ever. Okay. Well, I want to move on because we've only got a couple of minutes left. I, I, can, I can go on because I yeah. get very close. So you, 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 you thank people on Twitter? Absolutely. Um, Everybody? At a certain level. It's, um, I, I'd say like a $10 thing is usually the Twitter thank you. Um, it depends. If you have a massive following, you might not want to thank everybody at $10. You might want to bring that up to a higher amount. Like maybe, maybe you're worth $75 to say thank you to somebody on Twitter and get 500 retweets. But most of us aren't. Most of us can do $10 and it'll be a quick thank you. And people love that. I see people do the email thank you, and I'm like, nobody cares about the email thank you because you can't flaunt the email thank you. It's for you. Give it to them publicly because then they can retweet it, and then again, they retweet it, one of their friends might see it, and go to your campaign. And it's all yeah. about being out in the know. How about Facebook? How do you use Facebook? Uh, you, you, you don't, um, <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm hating on Facebook these days. Um, poor Mark. Uh, oh yeah. My heart bleeds for the brother. Um, no, the, um, Facebook's an interesting animal. I've, I've, I've analyzed it long and hard and I've found ways that people can use it without having to spend money. That's the problem with Facebook. The easiest way to use Facebook is interact with as many people as you can. So you can screw their algorithm and be able to have more than 10% of your friends out of however many friends you have with a single post. That's the number one thing. So the pre-launch work should be talk to everybody you haven't talked to regularly to try to talk to as many of those people as possible. Because what happens is when you post something, it only goes out to 10% of your friends. I have 1,700 friends. I see the same 100 friends and that's it. How and about Facebook groups? Facebook groups are absolutely number one. Well, number two, outside of personal pages. Facebook groups are number two because you don't have to pay any money to reach those people. They're there for a reason. The smart thing to do for Facebook groups is get in good with the admin because nothing pisses an admin off than having a newbie to the group come in and the second or third thing they post is about their campaign. That's the quickest way to get booted out of the group because you're not in it for them. You're in it for yourself. Get lost. So we have to work our way in, get good with the admin, and then ask the admin if it would be okay. And you have a lot of advice like that in the book, really, on how to ease your way into with social media. That's well, there's a whole part for just social media, and Facebook's got a few chapters. And, I, and, and again, the chapters got – more robust by the second edition because that's when Facebook started doing just 
just we, you know, we have like a minute left. Talk about yeah. your, your crowdfunding campaign team. Oh, totally. Yeah. In a minute, uh, the crowdfunding team, you might be a great spokesperson for your campaign. You're going to be the number one, but maybe you suck at social media and you just don't want to learn social media. Bring someone on board who can actually work on social media, schedule tweets, knows how to use Hootsuite or TweetDeck, and can push out content and maybe knows a little bit about digital marketing. You don't want to deal with the running of the campaign, you may, and you're going to raise quite a bit of money, you think. You might want to hire a campaign manager who is a person who makes a living running people's campaigns. They take a percentage of what's raised plus a retainer. So there's, there's, that's an upfront cost but that could be a very valuable team member. If you don't want to handle the fulfillment, you can get a team member, a, a, we call it in the film world, a PMD, it's a pretty new term still, uh, the producer of marketing and, and uh, distribution. You can get them to kind of deal with that part of uh, the post-production work of a campaign. Um, and then the biggest part of your team, I have three teams listed in the book, the A, B, and C team, Yes, you can get interns brought in. You can go to a, a, you know, a co-op education in a school and get them for credit working on things like, you know, hey, writing grant proposals because- We got, we got a wrap. We got, we, yep. So I guess we got a wrap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. That's this basically the show. That's basically the team. This has been the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. Uh, and my guest has been John Trigonis, who is the author of Crowdfunding uh, with, for Filmmakers. And he is the head, Indiegogo's head film campaign strategist. Thanks for, a lot for being on the show, John. Yeah, yeah. Had a great time.